sorry, everyone. Please keep the applause off till the end so that both speakers have the uh, have time to, to the, the same amount of time to speak, please. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I realize that some of you may be suspicious that perhaps religion or creationism is sneaking into the building tonight under the thin disguise of intelligent design. However, I'm going to be um, arguing tonight that intelligent design is not based on the interpretation of scripture or religious authority, but rather the basis of intelligent design is a branch of mathematics called statistical hypothesis testing. I know that sounds scary, but it's something that you probably do without even thinking much about it. On the tragic morning of September 11th, you probably were negotiating a competition between two hypotheses. Now, when it was just one plane that had hit one tower, the hypothesis that maybe this was just a terrible accident, or and by law, maybe it happened by law, I'm just referring to the the scientific laws of physics, chemistry, or biology, is there something that happened that, that resulted in that accident? But when two planes hit two towers, our thinking changed. And it became clear to us that the probability that chance or law could produce this kind of pattern was just too small. And so in statistical hypothesis testing, Typically, people informally calculate the probability, which in this case would be that two planes hit two towers, assuming that it happened by chance. We said, no, there's no way that happened by chance. In fact, many of you remember Andrew Card, the White House Chief of Staff, whispered into the ears of the President that a second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. It was at that moment that we rejected the chance or law hypothesis based on what amounted to a probability. Fire scientists engage in this kind of thinking also. When a fire investigator is attempting to determine the cause of a fire, I'll we'll assume that maybe it happened by accident or by natural causes by law. But a competing hypothesis is that the fire was caused by an unseen intelligent agent, perhaps an arsonist. And so a fire investigator will calculate a probability. Perhaps they'll make some observations, which I have here in green. Maybe there's a chemical residue left over after the fire, or maybe a recent insurance policy, an incredibly large insurance policy was purchased. And so the probability that these observations would occur, assuming chance, if they're too small, then the fire investigator will say that probability, the chance-based probability is too small. We're going to eliminate the chance hypothesis and declare that there is sufficient evidence that an unseen intelligent agent is responsible for the effects at hand. So, um, intelligent design is based in math and science. I will admit that intelligent design has theological implications, not for everyone, but for some it has theistic implications. But then again, there are several scientific theories that have theological implications. For example, evolution itself is based in science, and yet it has theological implications, not for all, but for some. For example, uh, notable examples are Harvard's E.O. Wilson, the founder of sociobiology, an offshoot of which is evolutionary psychology. Also, Joseph Stalin and author Richard Dawkins, who famously declared that evolution enables him to be a, uh, an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And another surprising addition to this list is the Big Bang Theory, which in the mind of Albert Einstein, who published this theory as an atheist in 1915, it had ultimately theistic implications. And by the way, these equations will go away pretty soon, so please don't break out into a cold sweat. But these are the equations on which the Big Bang Theory are based. And they're basically predicting that the universe is exploding out. Like if someone were to you know, pull the pin on a grenade, you would see this positive velocity, negative acceleration. And Einstein predicted that this is what was happening to the universe. But the implications of this bothered him because he worked time backwards in his equations and figured, well, wait a second. This means that there was a beginning to the universe, a moment at which the pin was pulled on the universe. And so he actually changed the equations to change the implications back to ones in which the universe had always been here. But Einstein was catapulted into instant worldwide fame when Edwin Hubble actually investigated to see whether or not the universe was expanding. 
and based on a statistical study of light coming from distant galaxies, it became clear that the universe is expanding. The hypothesis that the, universal, that the universe is eternal was rejected. And Einstein himself admitted that he had made a mistake by changing the equations just to change the implications. And so he ended up rejecting atheism and declared that there has to be an unseen intelligent agent responsible for the origin of the universe. So how does all this apply to biology? Tonight I'm going to focus, um, first of all, on the, the hypothesis testing that, that can be done regarding the first reproducing cell. Um, on one hand, we can take a look at the hypothesis that the first, most simplest, yet reproducing cell came about by chance or law. And then, um, if you look at the probability that this happen, of this happening being too low, then we would be obligated to reject this hypothesis in favor of the unseen intelligent agent. Now this is actually a point at which you might be able to get an idea of where you stand on evolution because not everyone applies evolution outside of biology. And we, When we take a look at the origin of life, we are outside of biology. We're lo looking at that jump from non-life to life. You see, the tree of life that Darwin talked about has this beginning down here. I've got it in the red rectangle where this represents the origin of life. And after you get a reproducing cell, then we can talk about the twin engines of evolution revving up, namely chance or random mutations and the law of natural selection, which preserves the beneficial mutations. So we're taking a look at what's the, what's the hypothesis test that would actually get this process started. Now, um, some people view that Darwinism is not just about biology, but about all of reality. And so, in fact, in chapter 25 of the AP Biology book, they talk about what's, what's going on in this leap from non-life to life. Now, just to help you understand what would be involved in calculating the probability of this, and it would be a very generous probability calculation. We're just going to give a lot of benefit of the doubt. But I have a video out of Harvard here that gives an idea of what are some of the processes that are going on in a cell that would explain, or that would help us calculate the probability. Now the processes that you're seeing depicted here inside the cell are going on inside of all of your cells, except perhaps your red blood cells, um, pretty much all the time. And you can think of a cell as a protein factory it's a protein factory that uh, is automated. It has several machines in it. And I'm just going to pause this right here. You're looking at a motor protein. And every protein that you see in the cell is really, it's like a word that's made up of an alphabet of amino acids. Now, this particular motor protein is transporting a vesicle. If you think of it as a Federal Express delivery system, it's part of the protein factory inside the cell. Now, um, it, would be, it would be incorrect to say that a cell is like a high-tech automated protein factory because it actually is a high-tech automated protein factory complete with assembly lines, high-speed um, robotic molecular machines, and error-checking devices. Now, Richard Dawkins defines biology a little bit differently than our AP Bio book, but he defines it as the study of organisms that appear to be of complex organisms that appear to be designed for a purpose, but then he goes on to point out that this really isn't um, designed, it just looks like it's designed. In fact, that kind of reminds me of the MacBook Pro that I'm using for this presentation, which also is a complex device that appears to be designed for a purpose. Now, when cornered, sometimes evolutionists will say that, well, if it looks like it's really complicated, then maybe we can imagine monkeys getting involved in, you know, lots of monkeys randomly putting things together. So, um, what I'd like you to imagine is what would happen if we did have, you know, give monkeys soldering irons and wire and, um, and plastic and metal. What would it take for them to generate this MacBook Pro? Well, even if they accidentally got the hardware, they would not get the software. I've got a Microsoft Office um, package on here in a web browser. And so it just points out that chance in law doesn't even have the right mechanisms in order to generate what is driving this protein factory. And that is what amounts to 
software. And the only known source of the kind of software that we see in a fully automated factory is a mind. And so we're going to take, I'll take a look in the next session, the seven minute session, about what exactly is the probability of a protein factory coming about by chance, and we'll also have an opportunity to uh, take a look at some other numbers. Thank you. Philosophy and the numerous analogies uh, that Mr. Royce was was so uh, so willing to, to set forth. And let's get into some actual science. <laughs> what I'd like to do to begin this conversation is talk about what evolution is and what evolution isn't. And I actually like to start by talking about what it isn't first. I've got a series of cartoons here uh, that I think really kind of clearly show the misconceptions about the theory of natural selection leading to evolution. This first one, evolution is not goal-oriented. So it's not proceeding in a certain direction aimed at a certain end goal. Organisms don't try to adapt based on a changing environment. <laughs> and they definitely don't get what they need. An organism can't choose to evolve in response to a change in the environment. <clears throat> and this is my, my favorite cartoon, uh, because there's a number of different misconceptions that pop up by looking at this uh, evolution of the Lego man. It's not a linear march towards increased complexity, like we see here. Uh, there aren't intermediates that persist with parts that do not have some form of functionality. Uh, so you see in this picture we've got a completely headless man, and the next step he has a head. And it's not building toward an end state of perfection, like this particular uh, graphic implies. What I have right here is a little diagram that I like to use at the beginning of any talk I have about evolution during the regular school year. And what I tried to do was simplify the process of natural selection leading to evolution so that my students would get a good idea of how to apply this. So what I'd like to do is use this as a lens uh, to look at a particular example so you can understand how this works. I went to school at Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois. And when I first went to the campus, I was shocked to see all these black squirrels scurrying around the campus. So I went to my biology teacher and I said, hey, what's the deal with this different species of squirrel that you have here on campus at Augustana? So that's not a different species of squirrel. That's actually um, a certain adaptation that the gray squirrel is showing in our region uh, because the surrounding environment is very muddy. My school is on the muddy banks of the Mississippi. So let me walk you through how this works. So in any gray squirrel population, there's variation within that population. That variation gets there through two possible pathways, uh, mutation and or sexual reproduction. So in any gray squirrel population, you kind of have a bell curve, a distribution of different coat color. You might have very, very light fur, medium colored fur, and then very, very dark fur. Now here's where natural selection comes in. So around the Augustana campus, the environment was very, very dark. So the darker colored squirrels tended to survive longer in that environment until they reached reproductive age, and then they would pass along those genes to their offspring. The offspring that they would have would still have variation in coat color, but it would be a little bit darker in terms of that variation. And then those offspring would grow up, they'd get to reproductive age if they were the darker color, and then they'd have offspring. And over a relatively, relatively short period of time, you get to this step right here called adaptation, where some form of the advantageous trait appears in the entire population. And that's where we had the black squirrels. Every squirrel in that population was black. Now if we took one of those squirrels and brought them back here to Lincolnshire, Illinois, and we made them breed with some of the squirrels scurrying around campus, in a relatively short period of time, we get back to the original distribution. But if we didn't do that, if you keep letting those squirrels breed with each other, over time, they get darker and darker and darker, and then consider all the other selective pressures that are being placed upon this population. And over an immense period of time, with lots of successive events of natural selection for numerous advantageous traits, the population becomes so different from the original 
that they could no longer theoretically breed with the original. And that's the point where you have speciation. And speciation is the point where you have evolution. So that's just kind of a simple example of natural selection leading to adaptation. And then the next big jump is to speciation. And that's where we're going to go right now. So um, how, do, how do we know? How do we know that, that species have evolved into different species over time? Well, to be honest, it's really an embarrassment of riches. I don't have time to present all the evidence to you right now. We're literally talking about volumes and volumes and volumes. Uh, but this is, these are, excuse me, these are the general categories of evidence that scientists collect showing us that species did evolve uh, from common ancestry. If DNA and RNA is similar when you compare two different species, more similar than, say, another species, 50% match as opposed to a 35% match, that tells you the species that have a 50% match are most likely more closely related. Same thing with proteins. If we take a look at modern morphology, which means taking a look at the bone structures of modern day organisms, if they have similar structures, then that tells us they have a common ancestry. If the bone structures aren't similar, that tells us that there may not be a common ancestry. Geological evidence, when we see the appearance of different body types in different geological strata, biogeography, when we see certain fossils located in certain geographical regions. And then finally, embryology, when we take a look at the embryological stages of different species. Now, I can't show you everything, but I'm going to cherry pick a couple of examples. Here is a killer whale, otherwise known as the orca, and right here, hanging from a wire in this museum is the vestigial pelvis, and here it is zoomed in right there. That's a really nice piece of evidence to tell us that whales evolved from land-dwelling tetrapods. <coughs> if they didn't evolve from land-dwelling tetrapods, they wouldn't have a vestigial pelvis. Embryology, evo-devo, and atavisms give us nice evidence, uh, nice pieces of evidence for evolutionary change. What we're looking at right here is a dolphin embryo at 24 days. You see it has a forelimb bud and it has a hindlimb bud. The hindlimb bud disappears. Dolphins only have two flippers. But if we take a look at their closest modern day ancestor, the hippo, the hippo embryo looks just like this and it maintains this hindlimb bud and then the hippo obviously is a tetrapod. Now we're talking about atavisms. This is actually an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin. And you see here, it has hind flippers. An atavism is when you have the reappearance of a trait that existed in prior generations. Actually, generations long past. And because of a rare mutation, they pop up again. Then finally, the, uh, the, the science of Evo Devo kind of goes beyond what we're looking at here in terms of structures with embryology. Evo Devo takes the knowledge of embryology and then takes a look at the genetics, the bodybuilding patterns based on the switching on and off of certain genes. And these genes are called Hox genes. We don't have a lot of time to get into that today. Here's an example of biochemical comparisons that tell us about common ancestry. What we're looking at right here are the number of amino acid differences between modern day species, specifically in the hemoglobin polypeptide protein. So we see that between the human and the macaque, there's eight amino acid differences, and between the human and the lamprey, there's 125. And you take a look at the numbers here, and you see a nice evolutionary progression. Another piece of evidence that we look at is taking a look at modern day morphology bone structure. And we have two classifications for this. One's called homologous, and one's called analogous. Homologous structures are those structures that have identical bone structures, they're close to identical bone structures, but they may have different functions. So you see here we have homology between a human, a bird, a porpoise, and an elephant. Here's the human arm, this is a wing, this is a flipper, and then we get into the appendages of the elephant. They all have different, um, they all have different purposes, but their structure is similar. If we look at a fly wing, here these two things have exactly the same purpose, but we take a look at the inter internal structures and they're entirely different. So that tells us that they don't share a common ancestry. And uh, what I'd like to end with, well I'm going to skip, skip past this. 
Um, so basically, we do have lots of evidence. I just showed you a few pieces, including transitional forms. What we're looking at here is the Tiktaalik rosea. Neil Shubin discovered this in the Canadian Arctic on Ellesmere Island. And this is the first organism in the fossil record that shows a direct transition between fish and amphibians. The Tiktaalik skull is, I believe my time's up. Thank you. We, uh, we saw some evidence of evolution, and it can seem really convincing when there's not an authentic competition going on. Uh, to be honest, Mr. Erdman, what I sensed is a, the feeling that I had during your presentation was similar to the feeling that I might have if I were to show up at the United Center and D. Rose brings the Chicago Bulls onto the court, but LeBron James and the Heat doesn't even show up. There's no real competition, and it might be impressive to see the Bulls score a few baskets, but you wonder, did they really win anything? Because there seemed to be an absence of competition. So let's continue on with an actual competition between two hypotheses. And um, let's take a look at the competing hypotheses of what explains the origin of life. Now, proteins are like words spelled with a 20-letter alphabet of amino acids. And uh, I just have some <coughs> letters up there to symbolize this idea of a 20 letter alphabet. Now, if you want to actually calculate the probability of the simplest possible, the minimally complex reproducing cell occurring by chance, it would be similar to calculating the probability of guessing my credit card information to buy tickets to Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, for example, suppose, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I have a new email signature. And I include, you know, my, my name, and Truth Seekers Advisor. I've also decided to include my Fandango. <laughs> my Discover card number. Um, I, maybe that was a foolish decision. So, um, and also my billing zip code. No. Um, so, but I'm, I'm betting that, see, on principle, I would never tell anyone the expiration date of my credit card because I don't want anyone buying things with my credit card. So, um, what I'm going to do is, uh, oh, but sure enough, I found out that someone did buy tickets to Pirates of the Caribbean. Somehow, they figured out my expiration date. Now, there are two competing hypotheses for how this could have happened. One, they might have just randomly guessed my month and year of expiration, which they would need on Fandango to, uh, to purchase tickets. Or they might have had access to intelligence. They might have taken a peek inside my wallet and actually looked at the expiration date of my credit card. So let's see how we would use probability to referee an actual competition between competing hypotheses. So here's how it works. And, you know, let's put an arbitrary rule on here that suppose you get only one purchase attempt at Fandango, and suppose that uh, only one person uh, has my information. So basically we have to look at the number of combinations of months and years. Of 12 months, suppose there's 10 years to choose from. So there's 120 combinations. The probability is one out of 120 that someone would be able to randomly guess my information. And in a standard statistics class, that would actually be considered low. It's like, oh, we're going to... St stat student would say, we're going to reject the null hypothesis because that, it's less than a certain boundary. But you and I know that a, one out of 120, that's not very low because you could easily get 119 of your friends and you could all try a different combination. So the question is, how low must we go to actually reject the chance hypothesis? So I'm tired of paying for other people's movie tickets, so I'm going to change my Fandango password. Here's the new one. It's the first two lines of Shakespeare's all's well that ends well. It turns out, although I, I will let people know, just to give them a hint, that there's 129 characters in my password. They're all capital letters and or underscores. So there's 27 choices for each of the 129 characters. Let's find out whether you have the probabilistic resources to pull this one off. Now, Mr. Erdman was talking about immense amounts of time, and you would need immense amounts of time, also immense numbers of friends, because the total number of attempts would be about 10 to the 184. But these, you know, to most Americans, all large numbers are about equal, so it's, it's hard to figure out. 
exactly what this means. So let's, we're going to calculate an upper bound on attempts at a new password. Taking all the probabilistic resources of the entire universe ever since the hot big bang 14 billion years ago. Which would also give us an idea of how many attempts we could get at actually generating the first reproducing cell. Did you know that there was a limit to how many friends you could have? Um, it takes at least one nuclear particle, a neutron or a proton, to constitute a friend. There's only 10 to the 80th neutrons and protons in the entire observable universe. No one will ever have more than 10 to the 80th friends, not even on Facebook. <laughs> so that also gives us an upper limit on the number of monkeys. Also, the Planck number in physics tells us that, you know, I don't care how fast you type, you could never make more than 10 to the 45th attempts per second to hack into my Fandango. That's a, that's a physical monitoring. And also, the number of seconds since the Big Bang is 10 to the 18th, that's 14 billion years. I'm going to give you not only the entire age of the universe to buy tickets on me, but also, I'll give you 10 million ages of the universe. So if it ever takes, if anything you want to do, whether it be to start a reproducing cell or hack into my computer, if it ever takes more than 10 to the 150th attempts, you would be obligated, if you are intellectually honest, like Einstein eventually was, you would have to reject the first hypothesis that you decide to go with. So, now let's move on to how this works. I mean, the point is that it was too low. There's no way that someone could have gotten that password by chance. Let's see how it applies to actually building a protein, let's say a motor protein. Well, the simplest the, the simplest cell that we know of has about, um, thank you, about um, 400 proteins, but it looks like we could probably get the, the bare bones of a, uh, of a protein factory with 250. So here's the calculations, um, and this wasn't possible to do until 2005 when Douglas and Axe published in Nature, but every amino acid in the, each protein would have to be a left-handed amino acid, all the bonds have to be peptide bonds, Typical protein has about 150 amino acids, some have much more. And in, nine, in 2005, Douglas Axe published in Nature magazine that the probability of a, of a string of amino acids actually functioning and performing to function in the protein factory would be 1 in 10 to the 74th. So when you take a look, and that's just for one protein, friends. So when you actually multiply or raise that to the 250th power, you get the probability, the number of attempts you have to make is 10 to the 41,000. That's a one followed by 41,000 zeros. Reject the null hypothesis. Thank you. Your credit card for a big screen TV from Best Buy? I know nothing about that. <laughs> So I'd like to get back to the, the evidence uh, for Tiktaalik. I'm sorry that I was, was cut off before. I wasn't managing my time well. Uh, but Tiktaalik, uh, this is the transitional fossil that intelligent design proponents have been asking for and claiming would never be found. Uh, this is the transition from fish to amphibians. It's a flattened skull that they found. There are spiracles above the eyes indicating that this fish had both lungs and gills the first fused neck in the, in the fossil record. And the really interesting thing is when you look at the tiktaalik, uh, the tiktaalik shoulder, um, the shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint. Um, and the real interesting thing is it's a flexible joint. This fish was actually able to do push-ups. Um, and they can tell this from the bone structure that this was, was a very muscular limb. Um, the really cool thing about Neil Schumann's story was that he understood the predictive power of evolutionary theory. So he knew when, uh, he knew when, when the, uh, the, the fish um, were hypothesized to live, and they found fossils for, for fish about 385 million years ago. They saw the first tetrapods appearing in the fossil record about 365 million years ago. So he knew, generally speaking, that he could expect to find a transitional fossil somewhere around 375 million years, give or take. And he explored two general regions. The first was near where he was working in Pennsylvania. He was looking at road cuts that exposed rock that were about the age that he was looking for, and he didn't find the transitional fossil there. And then just by happenstance, he was looking through a geology textbook, and he noticed that there was a region in the Canadian Arctic that had rocks of about the right age, sedimentary rock, and he predicted, hey, I might find that thing there. And the really cool thing is, he formed an expedition, he went there, it took a number of years, but he found what he predicted he was looking for. 
And that's the explanatory and predicted, predictive power of evolutionary theory. Uh, here's some evidence that Neil Shubin uh, proposes in his book for our fish ancestry. Uh, if you've ever wondered why we have hiccups, uh, that's a spasm of the diaphragm followed by a gulp of air. It's adaptive in tadpoles to keep the entrance of the lung closed while taking water into the gills. It's an evolutionary remnant in us. Guys, if you wonder why we get hernias, it's because in fish, the testes are up higher in the body, and in us, they have to descend lower through the abdomen and hang outside. And that leaves a weak abdominal wall, and then stuff gets caught in there, and it's very painful. Other evidence is the long, crisscrossing, redundant pathways of the trigeminal and facial nerves. We see a lot of really weird stuff inside where nerves and some blood vessels take really circuitous pathways to get to uh, the proper location. Cleft palates are evidence for fish ancestry because the way our, our face develops is similar to the way uh, fish develop. We actually have gill arches, and these gill arches become our, become our inner ear, jawbone, swallowing muscles, and our larynx, what I'm use, using to talk right now. And then the last bullet point, scales, feathers, skin, breast, teeth, they're all made from similar recipes and similar genes. But all this evidence that I've just proposed isn't sufficient for most intelligent design proponents. They'll say something like this, you're missing pieces, you can't possibly know the big picture. But of course, if you have enough evidence and you have enough pieces, you can make out the big picture, even if you're missing a couple. And now, getting to the mathematical argument. The problem with probability. I'm not very good with math, but I was lucky enough to ask questions of Neil's students, and they were able to help me out with this. <laughs> so if you, if you flip a coin 300 times in a single discrete combinatorial event, then the odds of getting all heads is highly improbable. It's 1 and 2 to the 300. And as Neil said, we don't really understand that, that number. So that's point oh, 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 90, oh, 49%. And the odds of getting any combination of 300 is that same percentage. Getting 300 heads in a row is no more improbable than getting any other specific combination of heads and tails spread over 300 coin flips. You'd be more surprised to get 300 heads, but it's no more improbable. So I did a, uh, I, I went online and I, I went into randomgenerator.com and had it flip a coin 300 times. I got 131 heads, 169 tails, and this particular sequence had a probability of 0.0949%. And it happened on the first try. It was a highly improbable event that actually occurred. So this is similar to what happens over evolutionary time. The improbable event happens at least one time, usually much more. That's all you need. Improbable does not equal impossible. Now, I, I know what Neil's response is going to be to this. So um, let, me, let me get into this. The other problems with probability, this ain't coin flipping. The variables aren't operating in a vacuum. It's multifactorial. You can't calculate an outcome based on a linear pathway to a predetermined destination. And evolution does not create de novo, but conserves at each step and builds over time. So we're not flipping 300 coins, and they all have to come out in exactly the right combination. You flip a coin, you get heads. Conserved. You flip another coin, you get tails. Not conserved. Flip a coin again, heads. Conserved. Now you got two heads in a row. Flip a coin again, heads. Three in a row. And then you build like that, and the probability is much less. And finally, I want to close with this. They made a synthetic peptide. This isn't one that you actually find in a living thing. It's 32 amino acids long. So there's 1, in tw one over 20 to the 32, or 1, one in 4.29 times 10 to the 40th chance that these will all assemble together. But if you take into account the volume of the early Earth ocean, amino acid concentrations, and a very dilute concentration, and you have a certain number of potential starting chains, 1 times 10 to the 50th, you can produce about 1 times 10 to the 31st in under a year, let alone millions of years. And then finally, these are able to self-catalyze, or autocatalysis. So as soon as you have one amino acid, it's been found in this particular study that once you have one amino acid, it can catalyze a chain of the same handedness of amino acids. So that's one hypothesis. A second hypothesis is the outer space meteor hypothesis, where the amino acids may be seeded on Earth through a meteor. 
These are untested. We don't have all the answers yet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Urban, for engaging at the level of mathematics. I, I have, um, I feel like I'm understanding that what you're saying is similar to the sort of hypothesis testing that goes on when someone takes a look at Mount Rushmore. Um, what I understood you to say was that you've got various probabilities for the patterns that we see on Mount Rushmore. And um, you are correct that this idea of improbable events happening on a regular basis is true. If you take a look at this apparently uncarved portion of the rock face, the probability of this configuration, if we were to select randomly from all possible <laughs> configurations of 40 tons of rock, is in fact equal to this configuration. They both have the same probability. What The reason that when you look at the facial features of those four American presidents, the reason that you end up eliminating the first hypothesis that they were caused by wind, rain, and erosion is because there's something more than low probability. There's low probability and a recognizable pattern. So when you look at, in biology, at all possible sequences of amino acids that may or may not fold into a protein, there is likewise not only low probabilities, yes, any sequence of 150 amino acids is, is just as unlikely as any other sequence of 150 amino acids. What differentiates life from non-life is that you actually get a specification, something recognizable, and in biology, that specification, that recognizable pattern, cashes out as function. If if it actually functions. And that's why Douglas Axe's work was so significant that it's so rare for a chain of amino acids to actually fold into a functioning machine that can be used in the protein factory. Now, I also noticed that you mentioned this idea of flipping a coin, conserving, flipping a coin, conserving. I might be misunderstanding that argument, but it sounds as if it contradicts what you were talking about earlier with this idea that evolution is not directional. It does not move in any sort of direction. Well, how, how could you decide, how, how could a matter and chemistry decide what to conserve and what not to conserve unless there was a pattern and a, a goal that it was moving toward? So. Uh, and also, just a, a quick comment about the patterns that you were showing in the homologous limbs, you know, the whale and the arm, the, the arm of the human. If you actually look at the different possible um, hypotheses for why we would have similarities between whales and people, um, it is possible that you could explain those similarities just like you would explain the similarities between the Corvettes from, you know, 1966 until the present, one, I, you, there are similarities among the Corvettes from 1966 until now, and one, one reason for those similarities is that there may in fact have been similarities in the mind of an unseen intelligent agent. Now, intelligent design doesn't try to identify who that intelligent agent is, just like a forensic scientist just decides whether or not the dead body effect is the result of an unseen intelligent agent like you know, a murderer or suicide or not. So, and um, likewise here, when you take a look at this particular motor, it's, uh, I mean, it is similar to some other things in biology, but if there are similarities in the design, it could be because there are similarities in the mind of an unseen intelligent agent. This is, by the way, you're looking at a bacterial flagellum. It's a um, rotary motor that rotates at 100,000 RPMs. It's bi-directional, water-powered, and it won't work unless all 50 proteins are there at once. Thank you. So Neil was, was just speaking about how there are clear examples in his mind of design. And what I'd like to talk about at this point are examples of poor design. Uh, we've already talked about one. Uh, the descent of the testes through the abdominal wall. This is Michael Behe's response to, to poor design from Darwin's Black Box. Michael Behe uh, wrote, wrote a number of books, and he's a, he's a biochemist and intelligent design proponent. He said, features that strike us as odd in a design might have been placed there by the designer for a reason, for artistic purposes, to show off, for some as yet undetectable practical purpose, or for some unguessable reason, 
or they might not. So right there, I think that's very definitive, um, a very, very definitive statement from Michael Behe that he, he doesn't have any idea um, why poor design, poor design exists. And what I'd like to do now, just to kind of lighten this up, is show you a clip from The Daily Show uh, with Jon Stewart. This is an interview with William Dembski, whose work uh, Neil has just been referencing, and a historian named Dr. Larson. So here's a two minute clip. Why shouldn't that be taught in schools? <laughs> Let me ask you this, intelligent design. This is Kroger. Uh, I'm, I'm a man. The most painful part of my body, this intelligent designer chose to put in a bag uh, that anyone could walk across and hit with a baseball bat. <laughs> speak to it. I mean, intelligent design is not committed to every aspect of reality. <laughs> being, being resolved, resolved. I appreciate yeah. you okay. even honoring my question. Well, no. <laughs> Seriously, though. No. Seriously, no. Richard Dawkins, well-known evolutionist. Sure, Richard Dawkins. Yeah. There's a lot of okay. stuff on it. So he will, he will write in a book called The Blind Watching that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Everything for him is only the appearance of design. There's no actual design there. So for me, I just have to indicate that there are some clear instances of design there. Brings up an interesting point. What do you say to someone who says evolution, schmevolution? <laughs> well, far be it for me to deny that God can intervene in nature. If God wants to, I suppose God can. So evolution but, is not mutually exclusive then. But we're talking about science here. And the problem with uh, divine intervention, a miracle, is it's not repeatable, it's not testable, it's in a laboratory, it's not falsifiable. Now, you're not, are you saying divine intervention? Are you saying divine intervention? I'm not talking saying? about the big G. I'm saying that there are organizing principles <laughs> in nature. What came first? A religious conversion or uh, the evidence conversion? The, the, the religious conversion came first. I'll agree. <laughs> but, but. No, I, I, I didn't mean that in no, any way other than, but it is, but it, it is something to consider that, that for each scientist that I've heard from, yeah. it seems that the epiphany uh, of religion is, is first. What is that? Okay, so intelligent design is not committed to explaining every aspect of reality through this philosophy. William Dembski's words. It's about poking holes in evolutionary theory and hoping that evolutionary theory crumbles as a result. And I think another damning statement here has to do with the fact that it starts with religion. It starts with religion, and then they go out and try to find evidence that supports their religious ideology. It's never starting with the evidence, and the evidence leading them towards design, and then leading them towards religion. Thank you. Acknowledging that bad design exists because bad design is still design. So did this place pack out tonight because so many people crave a review of probability and biology? <laughs> I doubt it. I think this debate stirs so much interest because in the minds of many, evolution is the foundation of a comprehensive view of all reality. Every comprehensive worldview answers three main questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? is one. Two, what causes suffering? And three, what's the path to liberation from suffering? Now, universal Darwinism, which goes beyond biology and says that everything is the result of Darwin, of evolution, even cultures and religions evolve. I, it's, it asserts that we are merely animals, mammals to be precise, and that accidentally emerged from ultimately mud and rocks. What causes suffering? Well, most pain comes from the artificial consequences imposed for breaking socially constructed or evolved rules based on random religious doctrines that restrict our freedom. And so the path to freedom is to throw off the random made-up rules and ditch the fake truth claims and maintain allegiance to nothing other than our own hearts. Thus our, choice and our, our choices and our ethical principles are rooted in our view of life's origins. But 
If the origin and development of life turns out instead to be the work of an unseen intelligent agent, the implications are staggering. As Will Provine from Cornell teaches, the implications of evolution have not yet worked themselves out in society. He points out that if we're going to be consistent with evolution, then there's no basis for absolute morality, no basis for ethics, and no ultimate meaning in life. So as you wrestle with this controversy, remember Einstein, who conceded that it was a blunder to let philosophical implications scare him into tinkering with the mathematical basis of the Big Bang Theory. Evolution is real, but it certainly does not generate the computer software needed to operate the protein factories in our cells. And so I encourage you to conclude that, uh, that there's overwhelming evidence for an intelligent designer. Thank you. Listening to Neil, I think some people may assume that he's an underdog. But I want to show you this graphic. Public acceptance of evolution in the United States. 38% of Americans believe evolution is true. 54% believe it's false. 8% aren't sure. This contrasts sharply with the percentages that we see in surveys of working scientists, which range anywhere from 85 to 95%, depending on the survey that you're looking at. If you compare us to other countries that are industrialized, you see that we rank last to Turkey in this respect. Now, in terms of teaching evolution, you may be under the misconception that this nation is filled with atheist science teachers trying to indoctr indoctrinate the, the children in their classes uh, in the Church of Darwinism. But 926 high school biology teachers are polled. 60% of the biology teachers in the country don't take a direct stance on evolution because they're scared. We call them the cautious 60%. 13% explicitly advocate creationism or intelligent design, and only 28% provide <coughs> thorough coverage according to NCSE guidelines, citing evidence, teaching thematically throughout the year, etc. So why should we care? I really like this quote at the top. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. It is the unifying theme of biology. It ties everything together. In addition, we're, using our, we're losing our uh, competitive edge in scientific research. Um, in addition to that, there's been an assault on reason. There's science phobia that's emerging. We have some people not vaccinating their kids uh, because they just don't believe what scientists have to tell us anymore. And then finally, there's a true dichotomy between these words. And I'd like to take back this word. There's little t truth, which is scientific truth, which is supported by evidence, built over time, self-correcting. And then we have big t truth. Big t truth is uh, the exclusive realm of the religious, of the fundamentalists. It's the truth about the nature of God and their own nature of reality. So, I'd like to end with this cartoon here. The scientific method, we start with the facts and we draw conclusions from them. In the intelligent design method, we start with the conclusion, and then we go out and find facts to support them. Thank you.